Did I just play that? I think I did. What the? Almost immediately, the feeling of fighting the string changes was completely gone. For years, I had struggled to play patterns that moved across more than one string. And now, I was playing one that slashed its way across five. What had moments earlier been just another scale fingering had suddenly become a three octave sprint that I could pick not only with total accuracy, but also with total repeatability as I reeled off one flawless repetition after another. If this makes no sense to you hearing it now, trust me, it made even less sense to me doing it then. But the suddenly uncluttered feeling of doing this was so stark that it was impossible not to grasp that something very different was happening. But I knew that couldn't be possible. All because of one thing, string hopping. This nefarious jumping motion was the fly in the ointment, a warp in the clockwork regularity of alternate picking. Just when you built up smooth and consistent picking speed on one string, you'd have to leap to another. And this felt totally awkward and unpredictable. With both string hopping and alternate picking occurring simultaneously, it was like an impossible tug of war. And this made sense, because alternate picking was a back and forth movement, and string hopping was an up and down movement, totally at odds with each other. Yes, alternate picking was back and forth, and string hopping was up and down, back and forth, and up and down. couldn't be, but it was. When I held the pick angled slightly toward the floor and played a downstroke, I could see that the pick tended to bury itself between two strings. For example, if I did this on the G string, the pick would end up trapped between the G and the B string. If I wanted to move to a new string, I would have to use string hopping to lift the pick over the string that was in the way. But if I now played an upstroke, something magical happened. The pick rose above the guitar body and broke free of the surrounding strings. This made it the perfect time to switch strings because the upward motion of the pick stroke itself became the string switching movement. Down was stuck and up was free. Stuck and free. It was such a simple concept. Now, I had considered pick angles before, just not this one. I had used edge picking from the earliest days, but I'd been doing it with the trailing edge. When I saw that Ingve's style of edge picking used the leading edge, I'd switched over right away. But it turns out that edge picking was only one component of his pick geometry, and not even the critical one. By using downward pick slanting and simply switching strings after upstrokes, the switching from one string to another became perfectly smooth and the barriers between the strings melted away. Holy sh The blazing speed of the Pop-Tarts lick boiled down to the genius of Ingve's single string playing, which could be connected together like train cars in any order and still remain perfectly synchronized thanks to chunking. Just like Ingve's single string licks, I realized that the lick I had created was composed of units with an even number of notes. The first chunk was four notes. And this was the same chunk from the ascending fours lick on the tape. Just backwards. It was the fours pattern, but with the accent displaced, so that instead of taking four notes in a row, you were shifting the window backwards by one note so that you were instead grabbing these four notes. I did this twice on the first string. Then the second string was a six note chunk. And the third string was a two note chunk. 
then the whole thing repeated. This was the whole secret to proper chunking. Patterns with an even number of notes that started on downstrokes would always repeat on downstrokes. So I could play the whole three octave lick with perfect synchronization between the left and right hands just by focusing on those initial downstrokes. But there was more. If those patterns always started on downstrokes, and that meant that they always ended on upstrokes. That meant that when it came to switching strings, my entire three octave lick switched strings only after upstrokes. By inadvertently mixing Ingve's even numbered note groupings with downward pick slanting, it was like mixing baking soda and vinegar in science class to make a homemade volcano. This was insane. For years, I had struggled to make headway and been stymied at every turn. And now, in an instant, everything had changed. How could something so seemingly complex have possibly happened by accident? I had had all these elements swilling around in my head, like ingredients in a stew. There were early advances, like deducing the note-by-note -note molecular structure of recorded solos. That structure was hidden by speed, but the SK-1 helped reveal it. Then there was the Food Town solo. It was built of smaller phrases, chained together. These phrases were still complex and not really identical, but I was beginning to learn, by feel, that organizing my playing into discrete units created structure that allowed me to play longer lines. And then there was downward pick slanting. Amazingly, I now knew that I'd probably been using it all along without realizing it. If I had never experienced its power before, it's because something was missing, a catalyst. When I stumbled across the uniform, repeating structures of Ingve's chunking, where every unit ended on an upstroke, it was like the lightning strike on the primordial sea. The reaction was triggered, and all the ingredients fused together. I immediately went back to the Ingve video. And sure enough, in every scene, Ingve was holding his pick with a downward slant against the body of the guitar. I'd never noticed this before, but I now knew that this was hardly an accident. The result of this downward pick slant meant that any time Ingve wanted to switch strings, all he had to do was play a lick that ended on an upstroke. And of course, I already knew that all of Ingve's single string patterns had been specifically designed in exactly this way. One of Ingve's most powerful single string creations was this one. It was, of course, an even number of notes, this time, six. And again, I found that if I just made sure that the downstroke in the right hand was always lined up with the beginning of the pattern as a landmark, I could simply ignore the other five notes of the pattern, and the hands would stay perfectly synchronized. Because I was only focusing on one out of every six notes, I could achieve 50% more chunking efficiency than I could with descending fours. Even at ridiculous tempos, this was a data flow I could easily manage. After thinking about this, this made some sense. There would have to be a trade-off between the size of the chunk and the memorization advantages that it conferred. There was a limit to the number of things you could stuff into short-term memory. Mechanical synchronization seemed to work this way too. If you made the chunk too large, the hands would slowly drift apart. If you made the chunk too small, you'd have to re-landmark too often, and it was confusing. This six-note pattern seemed to be a kind of sweet spot. It was long enough to offer a huge amount of chunking efficiency, but still small enough to remain tightly locked. 
like there was more. Just like with descending fours, I could increase the chunking efficiency through rhythm. If I could just align the landmark pick stroke with a metrically strong division of the time, then the arrival of the downbeat made it easier to anticipate. Once the landmark and the tempo were synchronized, it was almost impossible to play it wrong at any speed. Once I figured this out, the synchronization between my hands improved dramatically. I started taking that six note figure and moving it up and down the first string through the E minor scale. I had to change the fingering a little, but the concept was exactly the same. Each new fingering of the pattern would always begin on a downstroke, and all the notes in between would automatically line up as long as I was paying attention to the first note. And when it came to switching strings, the power of the six note pattern became even more apparent. This was great. As long as I kept the downward pick slant constant, I couldn't even feel the transition from one string to another. It was like they weren't even there. And in a way, they weren't. There was no string hopping because every upstroke was, itself, a string changing movement if I wanted it to be. Every time I played an upstroke, the pick was literally hanging in the air above the strings, just waiting for me to drop it down on the next string of my choosing. This could be a lower string, or this could be a higher string. It didn't matter which direction I went, as long as the last pick stroke on every string was an upstroke. Within days, I was taking this six note pattern and moving it at will across the neck in E minor. By combining this with the single string version of the pattern, I was finally able to connect one part of the guitar to another, just like Ing. I was finally beginning to develop real superpowers. And even more amazing, I could call upon these superpowers at a moment's notice, whenever inspiration struck. This was huge. Previously, my playing had been so unreliable. As it turns out, it wasn't the elastic guitar strap, and it wasn't standing up. And it wasn't even that I didn't practice enough, because God knows I'd put in the hours. In fact, despite my fears, there was nothing wrong with me at all. It was that my abilities had been neutralized by the disorganization of my playing. When patterns terminated haphazardly on upstrokes and downstrokes, it was like I was flying blind. This made some string changes easy and others hard, totally confusing my picking hand. But now, even my single string playing had suddenly become super powered. I'd already known about chunking, but by combining it with downward pick slanting, the two insights somehow seemed to reinforce each other even when I wasn't switching strings at all. The seeming randomness and unpredictability of my technique had completely vanished. It was solid, reliable, and devastatingly accurate. But wait a minute. Was I really saying that Ingve only ever switched strings after upstrokes? That couldn't be right. What about all those three note per string scales? There's one. This was the trilogy scale shape. It was one of the most common scale shapes in Ingve's playing, and he used it many times throughout the video. This time, it was a song called Black Star. And from watching the video, I could see that I had gotten it totally right. The fingering looked exactly like the way I'd been playing it since high school. It was three notes on the E string, then four notes on the B string, 
One, two, three. There's the index finger. Watch the slide. Four. Then three notes on the G string, three on the D string, and two on the A. So again, it was three notes, four notes, three notes, three notes, and two notes. And this was a problem, because I knew that if you started on a downstroke and played four notes on a string, that would be good. But if you did the same thing and played only three notes, you'd be stuck. And that would be bad. So I decided to take a closer look at what the right hand was doing to see if I could spot the actual pick strokes. The video was blurry and it didn't seem likely, but I thought I would give it a shot anyway. First, there was a slide. That was clearly a downstroke. Then, as the hand came back up the neck, that looked like an upstroke. Then the left hand played three notes, and the right hand didn't do anything. So those were legato notes. But I already knew that, actually, because I could tell from the records that those notes weren't picked. The use of legato here was more of a special effect to give a smoother sound. Fair enough. Then on the B string, we had down, up, down, up. The last upstroke was the slide note with the index finger, which was picked so you couldn't hear that it was a slide, just like in the descending fours pattern. So that was four notes on the B string, and the last note was an upstroke. So that part actually worked. Now, onto the G string. It was down, up, down, but wait a minute. The left hand pinky was already down on the new string. That can't be right. Rewind. Again, it was down, up, and then down again, but on the pinky. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Ingve was only picking two notes on the G string. The third note, the index finger of the left hand, was not picked at all. It was a pull-off. Not only that, but the same exact thing happened on the D string. Down, up, pull off. And before I knew it, the ring finger was already down, and the last two notes of the lick were down and up on the A string. So despite appearances, the G string, the D string, and the A string were all two notes per string as far as the right hand was concerned. The whole lick then, from a picking standpoint, was legato, then four notes, then two notes, then two notes, and then two notes. Every string containing fast picking was an even number of notes starting on a downstroke and therefore switch strings after an upstroke. I couldn't believe it. I'd already experimented with using a pull-off for the third note, and it just didn't sound right. But I guess I just didn't do enough experimenting. <laughs> When I counted them up from the B string to the A string, this lick had 12 notes and 10 of them were picked. It wasn't surprising at all that I couldn't hear the legato. In fact, I realized that I could eliminate the legato sequence on the top string entirely by simply starting on an upstroke. This caused the picking on that string to end on an upstroke, which connected perfectly to the rest of the lick. Now the lick had 15 notes, 13 of them fully picked. But what if I went even further? 27 notes and only three pull-offs. Amazing. Ingve's use of legato was not just stylish, it was strategic. It was an instinctive adaptation that used a single unpicked note to totally transform an unplayable passage into a slashing sonic stiletto. But this also had an immediate impact on Ingve's sound. His playing wasn't just a robotic assembly line of mechanized repetition. note received a unique treatment of picking or legato, muting or openness, an overall contour, the feeling that something inside there was actually thinking, moving, and alive. Things were really starting to get interesting. The Ingve tape had provided little in the way of formal instruction. 
but what it offered in return, the close-up view of Ingve's actual technique was so much better. There was a lot more here than met the eye, and I could only imagine what else lay ahead.